Yeah, I appreciate appreciate the introduction. It's very kind. Um, well, today um, it's an honor to be here with everybody, um, and always it's a a special treat and a special pleasure to to be uh, talking with my my friend and my comrade Denise. Um, and um, <laughs> I don't know if she knows it, but in general, when I'm speaking about her to other people, uh, the thing I usually say after saying her name is she's the, the smartest person in the world. Um, I don't, she's so smart that she makes me say a phrase like smartest person in the world even though I don't even know if I believe in either smart or person or world as, as operative terms or concepts, but, um, but she, she, she makes them come into relief for me. And, um, and so I'm gonna do everybody a favor, including myself and to speak very briefly so that I can get out of the way so she can talk <laughs> um, and so I can listen and learn. Um, I, I'm also going to do something that I almost never do, even though I know I should, which is I'm not reading from anything. Um, I, I realized a couple of weeks ago that the task of preparing a talk on this topic, on the, the question of the multiplicity turn, but also with regard to the, the problematic of the, the homotopic turn in, in mathematical sciences and the math, mathematical discourse that, that the only way that I could, that, I, that if I had to try to narrow it down, what I've been working on or what I've been thinking, what I've been writing to 10 or 15 minutes, it would be impossible because I actually truly believe that everything that I've been writing for the last 35 years has been on this topic, which is to say that everything that I've been writing has been about the problem of identity and difference. Um, and specifically what that problem means for, and also how that problem is dealt with um, within the framework of of black social and aesthetic life. Um, that's just, it's just the only, it's the only topic that I know. I don't know how to talk about anything else or where one would go to talk about anything else. And so because of that, trying to narrow my writing down or to, to, pre to present a text that would, that would address the topic on some in some succinct way um, is literally, literally impossible for me. Um, and so I'm gonna just talk. Um, I'm going to speak as if it were the case, which I think that it is, that this is all I've been thinking about for 35 years. Um, and I'm going to try to, to say why it is that that is so and how it is that that um, has come about. Um, and uh, and I promise that I will stop at uh, 3.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, I'm sure I'll break that promise, but, but, but it's, it's nice to promise. Um, so there's two problems with regard to identity. Um, and I prefer to think about these problems as under the rubric of homo homotopy or homotopy, I, I don't know how one would actually pronounce it. I'm gonna pronounce it homotopy because the other term that comes to mind is homophony. And um, although I guess you could pronounce that homophony too, but um, it's an interesting problem where to put the stress, right? Um, where, 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 what syllable to stress in, in these words, at least in terms of how they might be spoken in, in English. Um, that, that, that feels like a whole other detour to, that I want to go off on, but I'll refrain. Um, but, but, but it's this problematic of the, 
you know, the, the, for me, the question of identity and difference in Black social and aesthetic life can be sort of boiled down to this tension or this, this interplay, um, or maybe better yet, this interaction, um, to use Karen Barra's term, between um, homotopy and homophony. I'll, I'll start with homophony first as a musical term. Um, you know, on the most basic sort of, if you break it down on a basic etymological level, you know, in which homo is roughly translated as same and phony is roughly translated as sound, but also possibly voice. Um, then what's at stake is the notion is a notion of the same sound. But there's something tricky that happens between the application of homo as a prefix and the 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 sort of emergence or the 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 the, the instantaneous seemingly the seemingly instant instantaneous emergence of sound as that which homo would modify or that which homo would also prefix, so to speak. Um, and what one, one, one way to think about it is that a difference invades or emerges in the seemingly narrow, small enough to be unbridgeable space between homo and phony, right? So that if, for instance, we talk about homophony as a particular kind of musical event or performance or uh, composition uh, or work, what we're usually talking about is a leading voice that is accompanied by or fleshed out by subordinate voices or sounds, which usually flesh out and complicate on a harmonic level what it is that that leading voice is doing. So that even though we talk about the homophonic, so that when we talk about the homophonic in music, we're usually talking about something which is multiple, usually talking about something which shows up at the level of a, of a complexity, um, the many, the multiple, the, or at least, at least in this case, multiple might also mean few, but what's at stake is we're talking about a, 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 a musical work or a modality of sort of musical performance in which we've got now com several complicated sort of social modalities at work. One, subordination, right? Uh, one being something like a kind of burden carrying function in which the subordinate voices flesh out or complicate, right? Or enrich what is going on in the so-called leading voice, right? So that somehow the discourse of the homo, the discourse of the same, the discourse of the one that leads is only ever fully activated by way of this subordination of a multiplicity that it drafts and carries along with it as its sort of functional, um, as its functional subordinates. Okay. Um, this is to say, that the same, the homo, implies difference. It bears difference. It carries not just difference, but subordinated difference at its heart from the very beginning. And you know, I luckily I don't I don't think I have to talk too long to let to, to make sure that everybody understands that this incorporation of difference into the same that is given in the very framework of the homophonic as a musical modality corresponds, of course, to the incorporation of difference into the same that is a fundamental element, you know, of the social, of the brutal, vicious, political, what I would call anti-social structure within which we live and which determines, let's say, what one might call the lived experience or the lived reality of, of Blackness, okay? Um, and so I've got a problem, you know, with homophony, okay? Um, and the problem that I have with homophony is exacerbated by the fact that 
I am in love with so many instances of the homophonic. That the homophonic in musical art is like, you know, in general, something like what one might call the constant object of my desire. At the same time, there's a kind of another desire underneath that desire that structures that desire and also, as it were, deforms that desire. Um, and it might be called a desire for the heterophonic in which what we would be talking about would be a kind of already given acknowledgement of the multiplicity of voices that would allow that multiplicity not to be structured by its subordination to the one or to the leading voice. And that foregrounding of the hetero, that foregrounding of an already given difference that as it were, doesn't just predate, but in a certain sense displaces the one that radical already given displacement of the one, which is supposed to correspond to an already given displacement or deformation of social arrangements, which are predicated on the subordination of many to one or the subordination of difference to the same. The, the appeal to the heterophonic, right? It constitutes, you know, the, the, the basis in a way, then this is the paradox of my desire for the homophonic. It's, it is as if what one desires from the homophonic or of the homophonic is how it might be said already to carry and to open out into the realm or the precincts of the heterophonic. And so much of the work that I've done and I think a lot of my you know, colleagues have done has really been structured by this interplay, this, or again, we could call it this interaction between the heterophonic and the homophonic. Um, and I guess the thing that I would say today is that more than at any other moment in my life, I'm feeling burdened by the constraint of this opposition of the homo and the hetero, feeling overwhelmed and burdened by what strikes me finally as the radical inadequacy, right? To not only to lived experience as it has been experienced, but to the possibilities of lived experience as we might want to experience it. That those possibilities and those actualities, the, the prophetic vision of some alternative modality of life or existence, as well as the critical and historical accounting of what has already existed, right? That both of those formations are constrained, burdened um, by a distinction between homo and hetero, between sameness or between identity and difference that is inadequate. So that what we're left with now is the task to refuse that opposition and to see if it's possible to imagine a movement that is not held within the false alternative of, let's say, a homotopic turn on the one hand or a multiplicity turn on the other. Um, my understanding of homotopy is pretty, is a little bit less, um, precise than my already drastically imprecise understanding of homophony. But my understanding of homotopy is that it is that in the same way that we would speak of the same sound that at the same time carries difference within it from the very beginning, with regard to the homotopic, we would talk about the same place that in a way carries two or multiple places within it. Okay. Um, and what we're talking about is something like a subordination, okay, of, of a kind of complex movement or what I guess in topological terms and happily Gabrielle is here to correct my imprecisions, but, but the way in which uh, a kind of 
a continuous function between topological spaces creates an experience of homotopy, right? Of, of the homotopic. Um, it's, it's, but again, even then, what we're talking about is something like a derivation of the same from an already given set of differences. Um, and so, again, there's that initial hope, one might even say, that by displacing the false originarity of the same, by way of reference to the differences that it carries and that it admits it carries and that it absolutely understands itself to be in need of, even though those differences are subordinate to the same. But the hope would be that by making reference to that already given differentiation, whether it's at the level of place or at the level of sound, that somehow an alternative might have been arrived at. And I guess I've just begun to believe, and I believe that I believe this as a function of my tutelage uh, <laughs> underneath, under Denise, that, that the distinction between homo and hetero, the distinction between identity and difference is too constraining for our reality. So, so what I'm very, very excited to be able to talk with you guys all today about, and especially to listen to Denise talk about, is precisely this inadequacy of the distinction between identity and difference, and how it is that we might begin to both acknowledge the historical inadequacy of that, of that opposition um, to how we have lived, and also begin to understand something like the inadequacy of that opposition to how we want to live, to how we might live. So, um, so I'll stop there. I only went three minutes over my appointed, self-appointed time. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the refreshingly interdisciplinary thinker and artist, Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva, who addresses the crisis of our global present through Black feminist studies, philosophy, art, mathematics, quantum physics, economics, ethics, and aesthetics. One undercurrent of her work is recuperating sensibility from the system of scientific signification to divulge the modern episteme's fissures most notably in the form of value and capital, the political subject, and the racial dialectic. De Silva states that her work encompasses three overlapping modalities, critical, creative, and speculative. Here are just a couple of very limited and brief examples. The critical. Our moment of political and ecological crisis is marked by enclosures to existence and imagination. For De Silva, thinking the world otherwise requires alternatives to historical materialisms, reliance on the grammar of linearity that disciplines our modes of knowing. She urges towards fractal or compositional thinking, a mode that decenters time and sequentiality and instead seeks to identify symmetry and compositional patterns that, quote, repeat at different scales revealing, among other things, the racial event as the timeless structuring grammar of our world. For example, police protect property. Property authorizes absolute violence. Absolute violence protects property and the system of racial capital. Examples of her creative work include the visually stunning collaborative and experimental films with Arjuna Newman, Black Serpent, uh, 2016, and Four Waters Deep, Implacency, 2018. And then some of her speculative work includes, um, one example is Poetical Readings. Uh, it's a speculative method developed in collaboration with Valentina Desideri, in which the two explore ethical and political questions through techniques like astrology, palm reading, and tarot. For example, asking the question, 
how to image an ethics without the subject. And through a series of kind of speculative interpretations and dialogues, the tarot answers through the power to live with choices. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva is the director of and professor at the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. She's the author of Toward a Global Idea of Race, 07, co-editor along with Paula Chakravarti of Race, Empire, and the Crisis of the Subprime, 2013, and forthcoming in English, The Unpayable Debt. It is my absolute, really absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva. Uh, thank you, Minia, for this very kind introduction. And thanks, uh, Gabrielle and Romina, for the invitation to be part of this conference. And thank you to everyone who is involved in it. And it is a special, it's a very, very special pleasure to, to be doing this with Fred. I don't know how many times we have been able to be in a group together, but the, the thing that it's true to me is that listening to Fred and, and talking, talking with him just makes it so, so much more enjoyable, the thinking, uh, the critical thinking, and then also, you know, the, the speculative openings that, um, you know, that, that are so crucial to us you know, to us, whomever us, us are. Um, but it's funny because I had this introduction to this um, talking about black light in which I was saying that I, I, I realized that I was invited to talk about, to speak about something, but I didn't really have to speak to that thing I was invited to talk about, which I assumed was the, the principle of, of identity, and I assumed it was the principle of identity um, because, well, because because it was there uh, in the description. But the very beautiful thing that happened, and then I should have anticipated that it would happen, is that Fred Fred did that talk about about it, but also speaking to it, and he did so in a way that makes what I'm going to do now not as you know bad as I thought it was going to be. So thank you, Fred. Um, and it's not going to, it makes it not as bad as I thought it was going to be because um, you know, I what I'm doing it is it was is to speak precisely about that, you know, that interaction that Fred was mentioning. And but not in terms of an interaction uh, between the homo top, the homo and the hetero, but also more from within uh, the homo. But not again uh, directly uh, about it, but you know, in, our, in, in the ways in which it comes, it should come across. I hope it comes across as I, I talk about um, black light, this uh, poetical tool I have devised. Um, for doing some of the exposing, you know, maybe the exposing of the hetero in, into the, in the homo, um, and, and here thinking in terms of categories. Um, but anyway, so uh, black light is, is such a tool, a tool that I, I say it's a tool for uh, confrontation. And, uh, and it is, I mean, the, my, my designing of it, it came to me, I, I don't even know how to describe how, how that happened, but it came to me in a way as a response and an attempt, a response to and an attempt to target the disavowal of the racial and the colonial in contemporary analysis of state capital. And, and I do, um, deploy uh, black light, I mean, um, or maybe I should say the reason I, do, I uh, black light became something that I was uh, interested in, in, um, in working with is because, because of two aspects of what I'm going to call him, uh, call, call now, uh, the obscuration of the colonial and the racial in, in the available critical tools. One aspect is that this um, obscuration results in a limited critique of state capital, uh, 
uh, in that it precludes the formulation of a political project that attends to their modes of operation as mechanisms of subjugation. And that's about the racial and, uh, and the colonial. And the other one is that it results from how the tools for critique, you know, the different concepts and, and categories, which are all um, in, possible because of the principle of identity, I should say that, that those tools for critique, they enable the same, uh, they enact the same uh, ethical program that is the principles and formulations that justify uh, racial and, you know, the ongoing colonial, colonial violence. So with these in mind, as, uh, I initially deployed Black Light as, um, as a reading tool, and I did so in, in a critique of the classic historical materialist account of value, um, that is an analysis of the equation of value as it is presented in Capital Chapter 7, Volume 1. And, and I did so also uh, as I was uh, attempting to to kind of uh, show how these uh, four moments of the liberal political architecture, how they work in tandem. So the, those moments are the economic, juridic, ethic, and symbolic. And, and then one of the main, uh, not the sole, but one of the main effects of these categories and concepts is that they kind of hide this joint operation. So, so Black Life allows me to do, um, a few things, um, but I think one, an important one is that it allows me to track, expose and try to dissipate the workings of visibility as you know, this work is performed by the abstractions used in contemporary analysis of global capital, for instance, you know, in uh, distinctions in terms of like immaterial and immaterial labor and manual labor or cognitive labor and, and manual labor. So throwing black light, by throwing black light, it's possible to shift the focus uh, when speaking about material and manual and material labor, right? To shift the focus to the raw materials that enable immaterial labor. So for instance, like, you know, the copper used in these tiny wires in my laptop or in the plumbing in my kitchen uh, and, the, and the copper that is today's most, uh, perhaps the most popular commodity and a commodity that nourishes global capital as it siphons uh, labor power expanded in its production through juridical and economic architectures of colonial and racial violence, right? Through uh, the, the, the copper becomes available to us precisely through practices and methods of governance that affect displacement, dispossession, and death in places like the West Papua and Mexico and Peru, Chile, the DRC, to name a few. So maybe I, I wanted to have a, a footnote at some point, but I think this is the the, the point at which um, I want to have the footnote about the importance of raw materials for thinking, um, for bringing together ecological and anti-colonial and critical racial concerns. But um, we can talk about that later too, if, if there is a space. So black light, as you know, is another name for ultraviolet uh, radiation, and it does, several things. One of them is to turn uh, opaque things into luminous ones, but it also damages living cells, both you know, their content and also the code. So black light, UV rays rewrite the DNA and that's you know, how it causes um, cancer. Uh, kill, it kills the cells. Um, so black light does not illuminate. It makes things emanate or shine. And for that reason, I think it's perfect for imaging a reading procedure which instead of relying on transparency, right, the ontological correspondence to the ethical principles of uh, self-determination and liberty, uh, a reading procedure that moves to dissolve transparency. So in a, it is a tool designed to decompose the abstract forms, uh, the, the categories and concepts of the understanding and reflection which, as I said, are supported by the principle of identity and or, or, or call, would, would call or the, or the law of non-contradiction. Um, and more importantly, 
these uh, these abstract forms both presuppose and rehearse uh, the occlusion of colonial violence and also the general indifference to, to racial violence. So basically what I'm going to do for the next, I, I don't think that they will be many minutes, is just to describe how I use uh, black light in the reading of Marx's equation of value. And, um, and, then, and then that's it. <laughs> And hopefully through that description, I think the, the connections, which are pretty much interconnections between what I'm saying and, and I think of what Fred was highlighting, they will um, make it possible for us to, to have a longer, a longer conversation, a longer speculation. Um, I have, um, you know, I, I, I have something here. I, I'm not going to use it as a, as a PowerPoint because this thing never works. So I'm just going to read uh, the quote from Marx, the, the law of value, and then I will describe what I do with it. And I, we can always go back to this quote if, um, if it is um, necessary. So the quote goes like that. By the general law of value, if the value of 40 pounds of yarn equals the value of 40 pounds of cotton, plus the value of a whole spindle, i.e. if the same working time is required to produce the commodities on either side of this equation, then 10 pounds of yarn are an equivalent for 10 pounds of cotton together with one fourth of spindle. In the case we are considering the same working time is materialized in 10 pounds of yarn on the one hand and in 10 pounds of cotton and the fraction of a spindle in the other. So, so there are several steps in what in what I'm I'm doing in in here, um, and a very important I mean an, an important one is obviously to highlight the the importance of self determination here uh, presented in terms of production right the labor is a productive uh, element in that in that equation. And, uh, and related to that then is also the importance of time um, as um, the category that allows Marx to design concepts and other categories that will not violate, that do not violate trans transparency, even though they're dealing with the messy social context. So in the account of value, it takes two forms. So time is there as an ethical descriptor, the actual time of li living labor uses to create values, to transform raw materials like cotton into the yarn, right, into use value, and B as a quantity, uh, as a concept and abstract measure. So the social labor, which Marx chose uh, as a determining uh, uh, of commodities uh, the labor, so it's the average social labor, uh, labor time um, that's determining of the commodity exchange value. Um, so the process is so uh, after establishing that living labor creates value. Uh, so Marx in that so in that chapter moves to explain capitalist production through. Um, the category of surplus value. And here the equation changes because as you may recall, time and labor are equivalent to another abstract uh, entity, namely money. Uh, so for profit money that is always already capital is nothing more than the difference between the value created by living labor, exchange value and the value of raw materials and instruments and the value of labor. Um, so, what I do basically is to highlight these main terms in, in, in the description of, um, in the discussion of the, the question of value in chapter seven. And those are social labor value, exchange value, use value, surplus value, uh, capital, et cetera. So fo focusing black light on these terms, they emphasize the already bright transparent concepts and categories. So they, and then, so they, they these lose uh, analytical privilege while raw material in this case, it's the cotton uh, becomes, uh, uh, becomes luminous. And by focusing on the cotton, then it's possible to displace uh, the, the, the site of, of production, the element to shift the, the emphasis in, uh, from wage labor into, um, into slave labor, that it's then 
um, becomes, uh, you know, also it can also be uh, be counted as uh, as significant in the production of in the production of value. Now, this uh, the obscuration. Uh, of the colonial and the, and the racial takes place precisely in, in the movements that displace slave labor from, uh, that write slave labor out of time or, or, or make it un, unapprehendable by, by the category of time um, in both, right? As slave labor, so it's not apprehended by time as, uh, as the ethical descriptor. And this is almost obvious, right? It's slave labor, not free labor. Uh, but more importantly, also through uh, the category of time, the, the category of time as it, as it works in Marx's account as a social scientific category. And what I find um, interesting, I mean, important in, in the ways in which time is not relevant for, uh, in which time renders slave labor, slave labor irrelevant to the produ production of capital is because is the very fact that there is no measuring of the time that the slave, of slave labor uh, is produced productive because what is ex expropriated, extracted from slave labor is total time, is total production. There is no difference between that time that goes as, uh, that's paid as wage and the time that is appropriated by the capitalist as uh, in the form of surplus value. It is precisely the lack of measurement, the lack of distinction uh, between uh, one, one homo and the other homo if, to use, um, uh, Fred's, uh, Fred's terms is what renders uh, enslaved labor not something that can uh, explain uh, capital, not a proper category for explaining explaining capital. So I had other things uh, to say here, but I think I want to, I would like to, to stop here just by highlighting how black light in the ways in which I have um, I have deployed it, and I like to continue to deploy to deploy it. Kind of this 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 work of focusing, highlighting that which is you know that heterogeneity that it's there in the very description of you know of the situation. Like uh, slave labor is in in the description of the law of value that I just read for you in the form of cotton and in the in the form of the spindle, which can be made by uh, out of iron or or gold. So it's slave labor is there, but it is not, but it doesn't count in the explanation because the abstract, uh, you know, the abstraction that, that is the key to that account of value, which is time, cannot, cannot be applied to, it's not applied to slave, to slave labor uh, in its it's not applied at all, <laughs> uh, precisely because for it to work as an explanatory, to do its work of explaining capital, it has to be then um, both on the one hand, it has to allow to, for the comprehension of something like, like uh, productive labor, but only if within that larger comprehension, there is also a distinction in the case, for instance, for Marx, that distinction is given um, between uh, the exchange value produced wage and and then uh, and then surplus value. So I'm going to stop here, um, and uh, we go and talk. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, uh, professors Moten and uh, Ferreira da Silva. Um, I'm going to invite the audience to um, go ahead and start thinking about and posting questions in the Q and A. Um, I will first ask um, our two speakers if perhaps they have immediate thoughts that they'd like to share in response to the other's talk. Um, and then I and Umnia uh, will each ask a question and then we will uh, start taking questions from the audience. Well, I mean, the well, the, the, the questions that I think I would want to really want to ask 
Denise, it would be maybe maybe just some questions about the, the form of the equation. Um, and, and I guess I would even, well, my, my temptation is to, talk, is to say something like the, 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 the homotopic form of the equation, right? Um, and, and it would have to do with, you know, my, one of the ways in which I kind of begin to understand the, 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 the poetical imperative is that it, it's a, it moves by way of a kind of general disruption, a general disturbance of, of, of the equation that, that, that this is part of what is entailed in the, in the, you know, in the sort of refusal of the, the mathematics or the sciences or the, the equations of value, right? That 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 a that a resistance to the equations of value is a is a general resistance to the equation. And um, and within that framework, you know, it it speaks to poetry in this very particular way, since so much of of poetry seems to me to also be predicated on the sort of the mechanics of the equation at the level of metaphor, for instance. This is like such and such, a, such and such a thing is like some other thing, you know, that that, that figural language is already moving within that, right? So, so it seems to me that there's this great essay by Charles Olson uh, in which he's basically taking up some questions in poetry that for him can only be gotten at through a sort of emergent discourse on topology that he picks up in, in Riemannian geometry. Like at a certain point in the 1950s, early 1960s, Olson's understanding of what poetry could be is being filtered through those same innovations in mathematics that were so important, you know, for, for Einstein. And, and what I guess I'm and the, the title of the essay is equal that is to the real itself. And there's a beautiful sort of thing that happens in that very title, which is that the moment in which it seems as if what he's trying to do is to escape the logic of the equation, he can only describe that escape by way of a, re, a re recourse to the logic of the equation, right? And it's that impasse that I'm interested in. And, and that's why, um, Denise's work has been so important to me because because I feel like she gives us a way to to name that impasse um, and and to see if there's some way for us to work our way out of it. Um, and look, we could talk for a long time, and and I hope that we will, in much less abstract terms, about how it is that this impasse for equation or equivalence actually works. Okay. So let's say one very insidious political effect of the recourse to the to the equation would be something like what one might call uh, let's call it the Obama phenomenon. Okay, right. That's one very insidious sort of example of of recourse to the lot to the logic of the equation. Right. Um, so anyway, okay. But look, or a fuck, an even better way to talk about it, because because why? That's narrow. That's narrow and and provincial. Okay. So let's broaden it out and say that one way to think about the post-colonial commit predicament writ large is that it is continual recourse to the logic of the equation. Okay. Continual recourse to a logic of equivalence. Okay. Um, can I? And maybe can we can I get into. Can I yes, complicate this a little bit and make our lives even a little bit more uh, more impossible? Yes. Um, by thinking, okay, so the we agree in in that, and then and I would like to talk a little bit about the the what happens then with the, with the adding movement or attending to the movement in the equation and trying to disrupt the form, et cetera, right? Which I think is what, we have to shake the equation a little bit um, in, in a way, but that's something that I, I wonder if Gabriel is going to say, no, 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 stop that right now. But but I was thinking, uh, as you were, you were talking, um, I was thinking, yeah, the equation, the equal, the equation, the, the, the equation, the equivalent and the, the equal and the identical, 
right? That is a way in which the equal and the equivalent seems to make, create more room for us to move while the identical just holds it, just closes it off. Um, so how, okay, so this one complication, then, I, then I would like to hear you talking about the identical and, and the equal and why sometimes, you know, the equal and the equivalent, we may want not to let go of that, even though I totally want to let go of that. But then when I was, was, I was reading about the homotopic and homotopy, I'm like, okay, so I am, so on the one hand, I can, I can have the image, you know, when, when, a, when a function is, is mapped in the, in the movement of mapping, I have the image of it not quite fitting, right? I mean, the map, is, things will not quite fit. So that is an opening there. But at the same time, um, you know, we still have, you know, if such and such and such and such, and if such is equals to such, then, then such. So at the end of the day, the principle of identity now turned the principle of equality. I mean, not now since, you know, long time ago. Also, it's what's holding the very possibility of the mapping, whichever kind of mapping we are talking about. Um, so hence, again, then the equal, and even the equal in the, in the form of the homotopic, at the end relies on the principle of identity in the same way as, you know, Marx's equation of value does. Um, so two complications. On the one hand, that it is identical, uh, which is a problem that we don't want. And then on the other hand, even with the possibility of movement in the, in the given by the equation as opposed to the statement, because the statement we may not be able to, can't move much. But then, at the, and then, and then the possibility of a, of a mismatched or messy map <laughs> onto one space or the other, but still it's still held by, um, by the equal sign. Well, it seems like to me that the difference between identity and equality is a difference that is supposed to secure um, and or rescue. Uh, <laughs> it is, well, okay, it is the difference that is supposed to secure and rescue difference in general, right? Mm -hmm. From identity. Um, the idea that things could be the same but different, that relation mm -hmm. of two things which are the same but different um, is in fact the relation that secures relation in general, right? That's the, that, that seems to be the, the idea. That's the best way that I can describe the, the idea. Um, and what it indicates then is that the difference or the range of the set of differences that are, that are secured by the notion of equality and endangered by the notion of identity right? It still depends upon, identity still depends upon those differences. At the same time that it also must subordinate those differences to, to, to itself. And, and that's, again, that, that's, that's the impasse. So even the differences that the notion of equality is meant to secure from, right, the stultifying you, you unifying force of identity. Even, even those differences are still, those differences are ultimately in the service of identity and, and subordinate to it. I and, have a and all it, these things just work together. And, and the question is, we can then spin out a bunch of stories about a bunch of relations which are similar to this one or which are derivative of this one. And we could show all of the different ways in which those various relations 
all end in, or all, they don't just end in brutality, they constitute the very operationalization of, of brutality. And that's the, that's the, that's the impasse. That, that is something that happened to me in my classroom not long ago, not to me in particular, but was seen as I'm teaching this um, theory class and, uh, and the student just breaks into tears because the student doesn't believe that they should be drawing from a particular set of literature because they are not, right? And I, okay, so I am not, hence I should not be citing them. And then at the same time, I find myself saying, but it's a theory of justice, of course, and you have to be critical and analytical. And I find myself defending something that is completely, totally problematic because, because that identification just silenced it completely, right? So how do we, I mean, it is a problem of, you know, it's happening, right? I mean, it's happening in this moment. Why, when at the same time, this little identity politics is out and about in court, you know, like, you know, um, generating and uh, yeah, justifying um, more, more violence. So the ways in which, it, it, you know, it seems that it is abstract, but it's actually very uh, much part of the ways in which we go about doing this, also actually having this, this conversation. So as so I was reading as I was reading on the homotopic, I was I was wondering uh, because I, I could just wonder because really it's going to take many 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 months and years reading to feel comfortable <laughs> with it, but but wondering about the openings that are there, right? I mean, what what can become possible, but then at the same time, you know, where it can make close in on us again, right? And wondering whether that's in a way, uh, all we can do. So a turn to multiplicity might be just, you know, uh, you know that is this expanding, and then it seems that there is a, that is room for multiplicity somewhere else. But then, you know, if there is no one, if there is no equal, some kind of equality there holding the statement together, you know, the homotopic map, the mapping doesn't work. You need this. Uh, this indication of a closing off uh, to hold things together. You know, I'm not saying we do need, but you know, the tools we have seem to um, to indicate that. But then, then I have a question about poetry because I like to believe. <laughs> I really love to believe that even though the, the equal, even though that that is still at work, uh, that the you know the the multiple the multiplicity of meanings and then multiplicity of interpretations that come that with each word word which betray the poet they betray the poet right that is something that may betray the poet and the one who is reading the poem that that is something that even though I'm not saying it is something in the movement of emancipation but that is something in that multiplicity that your metaphor may under be undermined by whatever else that term may mean so i don't know what to say about that well it, you know i mean someday we'll you know we'll I, it's been like a little good week for me a good last few days because uh a week last friday i was in a conversation here at NYU with, with R.A. Judy. And, and of course he was talking about, you know, his, his ideas about poesis, you know, and, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, he wants to broaden out that term, you know, by, by bringing it back to the Greek, you know, he wants to imply a kind of generalized understanding of making which is how that term would be translated, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't have to constrain itself to the, to the specific kind of very, you know, I would say worldly precincts of poetry, <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. can you take poesis and rescue it from, from the poetry world, you know, would be one kind of question. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think so. I, I think it's possible, you know. Um, 
And of course, that's a subset of the more general question of can you rescue poesis from the world? And of course, the rescue of poesis from world implies the destruction of world. You know, is there what is the place of poesis in the in the in the project of world unmaking that that we have to, to have to be in, involved in? And and I guess what I'm what I'm trying to what I've begun to think is that you know um, it's really really the 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 if there's something useful about the kind of work that we do it it's it's that it might open up some that's not even right but that it 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 helps us to recognize it helps some some of us it helps some of us who are in very specific conditions to recognize something important about the ongoing conversations that maybe for lack of for for that for uh, that as a function of love we've been excluded from <laughs> right um, and uh, and I and I, I, I what what I'm you know. Um, it, 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 it uh, you know, for those of us, you know, even, even in the professoriate, which is, you know, weak at the end of the day, but for those of us who, in general, who have been, you know, as, uh, as Andaya and George Lamming and, and, and Shinwa Achebe would put it, for those of us who have been nurtured and sacrificed into power, you know, or into privilege, you know, we, 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 we have to think our way out of that condition. We have to think our way out of that condition of having been nurtured and sacrificed. I don't know that it's a thinking our way out that that it, that then becomes a thinking our way back to something. But in thinking our way out of that, we have to think ahead to some new alternative social arrangements. That thinking might then be the condition or the 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 occasion for for making, right? Mm -hmm that a kind of thinking together might be the occasion for making the new social realities that we want that we want to live. Now, for me, one moment of like I, you know, I grew up <laughs> like 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 every honest black nerd, you know, in, in the United States at least, you know, rereading, you know, Invisible Man once every three months. You know, that was my heathenish form of church, you know, and uh, you know, so you read, you know, I was looking at, <laughs> I was looking at, I just, I mean, I stay up all night looking at YouTube, and usually it's like, you know, highlights from soccer matches mixed with like jazz performances or like some weird, like for some reason the other night I was looking, I ended up looking at this is great you know, American football player named Charles Woodson. And for some reason, I'm watching him explain the tattoos that he has on his body. And one of the tattoos he has says E Pluribus Unum. And he's very proud to let us know that E Pluribus Unum means out of many one. And of course, that resonated for me, you know, with Ralph Ellison, you know, who at the end of Invisible Man is telling us, you know, um, you know, our fate is to become one and yet many. This is not prophecy, but description. Okay. And for him, you know, black music is the is the descriptive force that gives us our sense of this fate, right? To become one and yet many. And you know, he's not, he's obviously, you know, very, very conscious of the irony that that motto is also what's on a dollar bill. And I'm sure that Charles Woodson, the rich, famous Hall of Fame football player, he's aware of that too. But I believe that our fate is not to become one and yet many. I want to believe that our fate is to refuse the opposition between one and many, right? That has been imposed upon us on every possible level, on the aesthetic level, on the philosophical level, on the political economic level, the financial level, right? Um, that fate, which has been imposed upon us is one that we have to refuse. Um, and we have to enact, you know, um, we have to enact and practice 
what is held within the theoretical resources that we are able to cobble together. And in enacting and practicing that, we will have been able to live what's outside of the restrictive, enslaving, you know, sort of pincher, you know, that we're caught in, in this relation between one and many or identity and multiplicity. That, that shit's killing us, you know. Um, yeah, and then, but the question, um, so we, we, for instance, we, I think both of what we said in, in different ways, um, we proposed a question. I think we, we, we addressed something that it's uh, usually, that usually follows a question of what with texts that were about the how, right? How the homotopic encompasses the hetero and how, you know, how the equation of value. Um, and so to me, and, and I know I'm talking about it in the very abstract terms, but it's to, in the service of the very you know, abstract violence that we, we live with, deal with all the time. To me, it is, I mean, the, the, the challenge is to, in the, of the refusal is not to refuse with, a, with a, something that is in response to a question of what, because that will give you identity and equality, right? The one, um, because the what will be that thing, that, that one. And so the challenge is to figure out, you know, how, how to talk about the how without having to at some point say, this is what. Um, um, and we are always being called, and it's always demanded that, you know, you got to say what, whatever that what is, what you stand for or what you're aiming at. So I think, I mean, I know that one of the things that I love about the ways you describe Black so sociality, because Black sociality is what, <laughs> not, I mean, it's not what, it's a how of living. Uh, it's not, it's not a what, it's not what is Black sociality, it's a how of, you know, being social and existing social. Um. Could I uh, add a provocation to the mix here, um, which is that I, I do wonder um, how you all's comments can get us into Black, thinking about Black studies now, like how is it that Black studies as a project um, sort of prepares itself to be good stewards of um, poesis and its radical force? Um, and I'm thinking about really the seductiveness of the sort of um, sameness and difference opposition in this moment of reinvigorated um, the way that the university is has a sort of reinvigorated um, intention to incorporate minority and difference. Um, and this is what's, you know, producing Black studies tenure lines, but is on the other hand, also potentially blunting that radical force. Um, and so how is it that Black study and Black studies responsibly attends to um, that sort of, that the radical potential in something like poesis? Um, is it necessary and possible to resist institutional incorporation um, of minority indifference? Um, how, how is it that we can and can we afford to abandon this sort of sameness difference paradigm that the university has uh, managed to um, accrue with extractive potential? Well, I, I think that um, well, I, I think I think first of all, I should see if Denise wants to answer wants to respond first. Uh, uh, um, if you want, I can. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't have a, a great response. I, uh, I have like a pissed off response, not at you, Henry, but at the whole situation. But anyway, uh, so I can say it, and then Fred, you you can okay. you know, go wherever, however you you want. Okay. So um, as you're you're talking, Henry, I was thinking about something you know that you know black folks 
say in Brazil, in the US and other places, that if you want, you know, in order to you know to get something that somebody gets by doing two, you have to do 10, right? Uh, you have to be 10 times better, all, all these kinds of things. So I think um, to me, it's like dealing with that situation is, is similar in the sense that you have to do all kinds of things also in addition to um, that you will work at the university because, well, that's what we do, right? We are, you know, academics, but then at the same time, there are other things that, you know, that are so much around, about related and, you know, expressions, modes of doing black study that may be outside of the university or somehow facilitated by the fact that you are there. And then you end up doing a lot uh, because, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Well, I, I remember um, I want to recommend a film uh, to everybody if they haven't had a chance to see it. Um, I, I imagine many people have already, but even if you have seen it, it's good to see it again. It's good to watch it again. Um, the film is called Finally Got the News. And it was a film that was made sort of for and by uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which was a, a group of radical black auto workers in Detroit um, in the, that emerged in the 1960s as a part of a set of revolutionary union movements that uh, was as antagonistic towards the, the major auto companies, but they were also just as antagonistic towards the United Auto Workers. Um, towards you know the predominantly white and, and exclusively white run union uh, uh, of auto workers, and um, and you know there's another kind of interesting film that emerged as a kind of fictional counterpoint or counterpart of Finally Got the News. Uh, I think it's directed by Paul Schrader, which stars Richard Pryor and Yafet Koto and How Harvey Keitel. It's called Blue Collar. Which is worth looking at. They're both on YouTube. Which you can you can find them. But the reason why I'm thinking of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers is that because later on in the in the in the in the early '90s, I had a really great friend who taught at Wayne State University in Detroit named Catherine Lindbergh. And Catherine and her partner Murray Jackson, who's an extraordinary poet who published poetry with Broadside Press that that Henry that uh, Dudley Randall started in the in the 1960s, uh, they were they were tight with 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 one of the leaders of the league of the league, this sort of extraordinary person named General Baker. Um, and I remember I was so excited to meet General Baker at Catherine and Murray's house. And General Baker, he he just wanted to talk about Marx and Althusser, right? I mean, and he basically was like, and he looked at me and I, you know, and I was feeling some kind of way about being an academic, you know, and sort of tainting the, 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 the atmosphere, you know, that his presence, you know, was, was, was giving off, you know, and I was like, can I, I'm not even really worthy to be, you know, in the same room talking with this man, you know, and he, and I literally never forget, he looked at me and just said, we need theorists, you know, and I, that gave me, that gave me some energy to continue to try to do what I was doing for a long time, even though I think I've gotten to the point, you know, where I would never want to call myself a theorist anymore. And I cert and I would even, if I ever had a chance to talk with General Baker again, which I'm, I hope I get a chance to see him someplace else later on, because he, he's passed away now, I would say, yeah, you know, Mr. Baker, I kind of disagree. I don't know that we need theorists. I think maybe what we need is experimentalists, you know? Um, but I say all that to say this. He worked for Dodge and General Motors. That's how he made a living for his family. And that's also how he met workers. He worked for Dodge because that's where the workers were. That's where the black workers were, you know? And, and I don't think he was ever racked with guilt about the fact that he worked for the company that he was trying to destroy or that he worked within the political economic system that he was trying to destroy. Like that didn't, 
produce in him a kind of self-consciousness that became self-destructive, debilitating, but that also produces all kinds of like really fucked up forms of aggressivity that are directed towards everybody else who was in that same situation, right? So that that kind of, you know, I don't, he didn't, he didn't have, because he did not seem to be racked by auto worker self-hatred, it feels like it authorizes me not to be racked by academic self-hatred, right? So if I can bracket that and set that aside, then we come to the real actual question, right? And the answer, the address to the question that you ask, Henry, and the address to that question is simply, you know, what we, we do, what, you know, how we, if Black study, or for that matter, Black studies, has some task, has some role to play in the preservation and the mobilization of the radical resources that are given in Black social life, that role will have been played out in its practice, in its experimental practices. So there's no overarching theoretical or conceptual formulation that we have to arrive at in order to unlock those practices and that potential. We just have to start working different, right? We have to do what we do differently and better. And we have to try new things and, and, and mess those new things up and then try some new shit. You know, like, you know, I would, you know, one formulation and then I'll shut up would just be, you know, I, I know, I really don't know why any Black Studies program would ever have exams. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I kind of don't quite understand why any Black Studies program would have classes. There might be a reason for it. It might be possible to justify, but to simply assume, right? And then to simply accept an already given structure of how a certain kind of advanced intellectual life is supposed to be lived in the university. Why, why would, how could we possibly assume that shit? You know? So these are questions that are about experimental practice. I don't need to have a theory of why it is that, that we shouldn't have classes or for that matter, a theory of why we should. I, you know, what I need to be is like willing to be part of a group of other people who are saying, maybe we could do this better. Maybe the shit that we do and the shit that we want is incompatible with these structures. At which point, how do we obliterate these structures? And who do we have to either kill, fight, shoot, or lie to so that we can continue to be able to like support what we do, right? You know, that those are the, you know, so. Um, Um, I love what you said about experimentation, because lately I'm just like, oh, my life purpose maybe is to start a center for experimental living. Mm -hmm. um, but so I have some provocations as well. Um, they're a little bit disconnected um, from the current conversation, but also connected. The first one is really broad, but I think really important. I'm curious how you all think about slave labor or slavery um, right now in this current moment. We know that it's well and alive. Um, how do you, you know, I was listening to both of you and I know what we mean when we talk about, um, you know, the slave or slavery in a Black studies context, but I'm curious how you think about that in the present. Um, and then, you know, relatedly, I was watching one of your talks, um, Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva, on the refugee crisis and the racial border of global capital. And you're talking about um, the kind of like problematic indistinction between border protection and refugee protection, that borders are justified through the logic of cultural difference. And so I was thinking about this as you all were talking about the homo and the hetero that cultural difference is the explanatory logic of um, the violence and human rights abuses that refugees are enduring at the borders. And then I was reading statistics um, by the UNHCR that there are 82 million forcibly displaced people in the world right now and 26 million refugees. Um, 
And so while the system is working the way it was designed to, I think the more important point is that the system is completely failing our species. Um, so if either of you could talk about um, either the Black Studies Project or maybe more broadly the project of Blackness, Black people um, in relation to the refugee crisis, in relation to the capitalist and ecological crisis that we're dealing with right now, because it seems like um, we're in really desperate need of new experimental autonomous forms of social and political um, organization. So I'm curious about how you begin to get there. Um, how do you begin to unknow and undo the world at the individual level and at the collective level? And what's the role of speculation, experimentation, sensation in unorganizing, unforming, unthinking? Thank you. Thank you, Mina, for, uh, for the question. As you were, um, as you're speaking now uh, towards the end, um, so I was tempted to say, so maybe you are not, um, maybe the how in your question is something that comes at the end. So you made this, we had a statement that we need uh, many experimentations and speculation in order to do it differently. The question is how. Uh, and when I get to that how, I always uh, tend to go back and say, how is something that we are going to figure out you know, together, because if one person says they know how, then um, we have a problem. That is no longer an opening, that is no longer, you know, the opening up to, to other things. But I think one, one there is one way in which I, I, you know, we can talk about how, and, and it, it, to me, it has to do um, how we describe what's happening, right? Because when we when we list all those crises of the past twenty years, it is we are talking. It is as if we are talking about different things, right? We, we go back to, you know, the Bush global war on terror in two thousand one. I mean, we got a, we got all kinds of global crises and catastrophes in these twenty years, and then and global warming is the ongoing one that you know we don't talk much. We don't talk much about. So I think one important part of uh, of the how is is that we have to stop thinking of those as separate. They're not the same. It's not about saying coming up with another homo of mapping one into another and <laughs> create some kind of equivalence equality. No, but it is about a certain awareness of how um, of how they you know they are they are operating through. And because, and also in support of, you know, of the same infrastructure, and and that's the infrastructure of state capital, which now has turned uh, financial capital, but it still relies on total violence in the same way that it relied that that juridic economic structure relied on total violence five hundred, you know, five hundred years ago, and and that total violence in that we we we. We can we can point now to to what's happening what's happening in the frontier in the border between Belarus and and Poland, but what's kept it's been happening in the DRC in that region for how many dozens dozens of years. So the question is, so what is it that we need to do in order to be able to think of them at the same time, right? To actually erase the borders of some of, of the categories we have and think in a, in a way that uh, allows us to, um, to make, so I, 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 I'm obviously obsessed with the thinking and, and I am obsessed with, with thinking well, because I'm a nerd, but also <laughs> because I think it's important when we think, when we think about something, which by, by which I mean not some elaborate theoretical whatever, but just just take attending to it, taking it into account. It takes care of the indifference with which we treat everything that we don't care and don't think about. You see, so we should we must be able to think um, to find a way of thinking all those catastrophes um, together. One, two, as I, as I just mentioned. Um, 
the, the this liberal infrastructure, this juridic jud jud economic infrastructure, has always relied on total violence. Uh, and it continues to produce, it, you know, to live off enslaved labor, and it continues to live off of displacement, death, dispossession, right? And like what Glissant describes, the forced deportation of persons from Africa, you know, and then you, and the forced displacement of persons in the Americas that created this whole thing. So maybe we should begin to talk about on, on those terms, and and then from there ask the question of how, right? Because I, I don't think that you know the tools and frameworks we have available now can do that. We get all confused with all the complexity or identify contradictions um, because you know, because we, we think of them separately. But in terms of experiment, uh, I think on the one hand, as I said before, uh, it is it is a collective <laughs> it is collective work to be done. But then at the same time, I'm more and more uh, convinced that you know, those practices are, um, have been there. So in Brazil, folks have been talking about a quilombamento, right? I mean, this quilombo is the, the community of runaway slaves. And they describe, when they talk about the quilomba and describe the practices of a quilombamento, what I see are practices that, I don't, you know, I saw in my grandmother's house, right? I mean, in my neighborhood. And I'm sure there were practices that uh, respond for the fact that there are so many black people in Brazil in spite of all the attempts at our disappearance <laughs> from the country, right? There are ways in which in black sociality, there are things, I'm not celebrating, yes, you know, we are ab above and beyond the violence, but I think at the same time, we also have to look at uh, the practices that are there while at the same time, um, doing the work for creating more space for those practices to proliferate <laughs> instead of letting them be destroyed. And then at the same time, collectively work towards designing some other house. I don't know, Fred, you know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just nodding my head in agreement. You know, it turns out I'm, I'm teaching two classes a semester. So one is called the, the performance of everyday life. And then the other is just a kind of reading class. We were slowly reading uh, Alexander Whaley's, um, you know, uh, habeas viscous, which means that in addition to reading him, we're also really diving as much as we can into Spillers and, and Sylvia Winter. Um, and by the end of both classes, I'm all I'm talking about is my grandma. You know? So, <laughs> so I, I, and and trying to again get an understanding of those practices, which I recognize that I cannot return to, and which I also still recognize as absolute models for an alternative practice. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, when you were talking before, Denise, about, about, you know, talking about Marx and time and that the slave is, you know, is under a regime in which their time is completely taken. They have no time. Um, they, they cannot even have time, right? That in, that in the, the condition of the slave is to be radically excluded from the very possibility of having. And that includes you can't even have time. Um, and of course, what that means under, under racial capitalism is, you know, and under a racial and sexual capitalism is that, um, you know, is that it, it is the condition of total access, right? And when you say total violence, I, I hear total access, you know. Um, or the way Spillers would put it would be to be absolutely available in the flesh, you know, to slave masters. And um, and what's interesting is that, you know, um, the 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 history of capital is the history of, on the one hand, recognizing the limitations to exploitation that slavery 
produced for the capitalist in terms of the capacity to 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 operationalize and to and to and to accumulate total access and at the same time the development of capitalism in the in the in the illusory moment of post emancipation has been to reconfigure and to re-engineer and to retrofit the conditions that will have produced total access, right? And um, it's as if the capitalist says, well, we can't go back to those old modalities of chattel slavery, but they still constitute the model for, how, for, our, new, for, our, for our alternative modalities of development, right? And so, and so, so that the analysis and the, the critical you know, historiography of slavery is absolutely crucial, strangely, you know, <laughs> for both the capitalist and, and for us. You know, um, like I, I keep, I, I wonder, you know, it's like those stories that like A.L. Weitzman tells about how the Israeli defense forces were really paying attention to Deleuze, you know, and that it helped their practices of surveillance to be reading about, rise, about the rhizome, you know. And I can't help but think that, that all this new economic historiography on slavery that you get in, you know, Ira Berlin and uh, Edward Baptist and, and uh, Walter Johnson and, you know, even going back to Eric Williams, that I would imagine that for the truly advanced capitalist, all those books are on his shelf too, you know. Um, those mugs, they're always looking for a new idea, you know? I mean, so, um, which means that they're always looking for an old idea, you know? Um, and, and it's an interesting homo, homotopic relation, so to speak, between us and them that, that, uh, that, we're, that we're reading what they read and they're reading what we read too, you know? Um, and I think maybe that's how come I share the frustration too sometimes with students who don't want to read X or Y or, you know, I'm like, well, what 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 gives you the right to be so luxurious, you know? But uh, anyway, so. Um, there's a few questions from the audience. In the interest of time, I'm going to see if I can. Uh, pose shorter ones um, more than one at a time and just invite you all to respond to whatever you'd like to. Um, so Veronica asks, can we talk about um, what appositional means? Um, what is appositionality for Black studies? So that's the first question. Um, another question here from Vincent is, what sorts of methodologies and ways of engaging study help you explore the complex nature of writing about Blackness in a world that needs to master and dominate in order to know? Well, I can just say very briefly, um, it's connected to what I think Denise was saying before with, with regard to the you know, the question of the refugee crisis, which is a problematic of, you know, it's a question of displacement. It's a question of how, in the interest of settlement and cultivation, racial capital deploys displacement, which becomes problematic for us because in a lot of ways, you know, displacement then becomes our weapon of choice too, you know? Um, and I would say, you know, that apposition, at least in the way that that I've been trying to use it, you know, and, and other people too, particularly R. A. Judy, he talks about it, uses it too, you know, is is really about, you know, a, a particular kind of mobilization, if you will, of 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 a of a kind of, you know, a, 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 of an alternative logic of displacement. The, when I say opposition, I kind of mean displacement, and I mean displacement in this very particular way. It's it's a hack, really, to, to use Denise's term, it's a hack, okay? Or it's a it's a meta hack, you know? So there's this beautiful poem by Mary Baraka called Return of the Native, in which he uses the word placement, but he places a slash in between place and mint, 
and he spells mint, M-E-A-N-T, okay? Um, and then there's this other beautiful hack uh, that though Bessie Phillip, you know, uses in a famous essay, you know, when she talks about displace, D-I-S space, P-L-A-C-E. So, so the meta hack would be to talk about displacement as D-I-S space, P-L-A-C-E slash M-E-A. A N T, like a kind of, you know, a, a hack of that comes by way of reading Baraka with Norbessi. And really, this beautiful chance I had to be in the same room with the both of them a couple of different times and, and to hear the resonance of their their speech, you know, and so and it and it's really, you know, how do we people who have been forced to move mobilize on their own, <laughs> like that's one possible dilemma. Um, so that's that's the address of the the apposition question, and I and I actually think it probably addresses the other question too. So I'll shut up. <laughs> um, that's that's what I was going to say that you were already addressing the the other question, but I was just trying to uh, see if the image of doing that, right? Because it is not about moving is not about a line that you move away, the methodology, you know, the ways to run away from here, it should be somewhere else, some other place. I think, you know, going back to slavery, that, that total, that total, uh, total access, total violence, absolute lack of time, you know, created what, you know, enabled also these ways of making time out of making way out of no way, right? Making time out of no time, right? And that is this movement, right? These disruptions, this disorganization or the stealing from the kitchen, right? Yeah. Whatever. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. The methodologies and the strategies, yeah, I think they're, many of them are there and others we can imagine. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like in the, in the absence of time, we, we made rhythm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Um, I'll read out and sort of try to summarize some of the other questions. Um, we have from Belaram Usov. Um, thanking you uh, for the concept of black light and then asking about um, the relationship between black light and uh, Derrida's deconstruction. Um, is there something about deconstruction which could be blacklighted? Um, uh, we have another... Oh, go ahead. Yes, because it's going to be a, a, a short. It's going to be short as, as an answer. I think I think I can say that like Fred, we we grew up, we grew up in the you know in that in in that moment post structuralism. I think I was more on the Foucauldian side of things for a while. And then, and then of course, I don't, uh, I don't obey the, the, the frontiers very well. So anyway, uh, but I think, um, yeah, so black light, that is something in there. But what I, I like about black light is that it doesn't, it doesn't stop at inhabitation because it's, you know, it, it shifts, changes the code, right? And it destroys the thing, the whole thing. Of course, um, you know, that raises all kinds of questions that I don't wanna deal with now, but I think it is, it, it um, yeah, it comes, it grows out of, a, you know, a training an interest and a relationship to the deconstruction, but it, but it, um, you know, thinking in, in terms of blackness, it also acknowledged that there is no, no, no investment in, in, in this habitat. <laughs> I think I would say that. So black light will tear the fabric of the, the, the habitat. That's beautiful. Um, a question from Sean Matharo. Um, what do you all think about the dialectic in the law of non-contradiction in the context of the laws of equivalence and or other identity that were mentioned earlier. And then a longer question from Steve Schwarzberg um, that I'll start maybe at um, halfway through. 
State institutions are based on a framework of absolute power and such power is generally absent in indigenous communities. Indigenous justice is just a challenge to state sovereignty as the organizing principle of the world. An indigenous community provides pragmatic interpersonal context for individual life. How will what I do affect others? Who am I in relation to others? This context is immediate palpable an awareness in the moment as opposed to a rationalized conception of shoulds and norms. Maybe what I'm asking for is just to listen to more of your thoughts on black and indigenous sociality. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at the last one and I'll let uh, Denise talk about non-contradiction and the, the dialectic because 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 she was paying attention during the, the Hegel part of of our education and I I nodded off during that part so I'm, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna let that go but but uh I would, you know, the, man, my, my thoughts on Black and Indigenous sociality. Um, well, the one thought I have is, it's like, I, I read the question and I'm totally, you know, convinced by it. Um, it just disappeared in my in my on my screen it was there and now it's gone it's like this big question that disappeared but but i think part of what the question had in it was that uh well two two things that may might be contradictory i don't know if they work together or not but one you know is the the, the sense that that there's something in black and indigenous sociality that goes against the grain of of sovereignty in in every instance and um and I would want to say that I believe that, or I would also want to say that I believe in that, 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 that what I'm, that, that what I'm trying to, what I'm interested in is paying attention to the particular modes of paying attention to Black and Indigenous sociality that occur in Black and Indigenous sociality. And that was a convoluted sense, but it was actually precise. You know, right? I want to pay attention to how Black and Indigenous sociality pays attention to itself. Right, right. Like it's kind of like James Brown lyrics. James Brown lyrics are always commentary on the song that's being played right then. <laughs> right. There, for, 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 like, for what am what are we doing right now? Okay. And another 45% of it is, are we doing it? Right? And all about the established, the social conditions of the music produced at that moment. Okay? Um, and I believe that those that in those moments, James Brown is expressing something that's essential to, to Black social and aesthetic life and Indigenous social and aesthetic life. This, this sensitive attention to what it is that we're doing right now. And I think a lot of what happens in you know, this Stefano and I try to write about it in the undercommons. A lot of what happens in academic life is in the interest of staking a theoretical position, we become negligent with regard to what it is that we're actually doing. So sometimes you just have to say, well, what, what the fuck are we doing right now? You know? Um, and hopefully you can say it in a, like a really funky way, you know? Um, and then, uh, but when we, but then the other part of the question that was for me uh, that I would want to ask some questions about would be um, when you talk about what's going on in Black and Indigenous social life as if it were just a better and smarter version of the relations between one and many or sameness and difference or I and thou or I and the state or, or the, the individual in the community. Then I think I, 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 my suspicion is that what's going on in Black and Indigenous social life is not adequately approached by way of those oppositional structures. Okay, so um, yeah, that's 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 what I would say. But 
now now to non-contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing, oh, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Um, I wasn't paying that much attention, but also, but I am going to talk about it anyway. Um, I so okay, so we, we know that there are those three laws of logic, right? The principle of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the principle of the excluded mid middle. And at, and then reading Hegel, I always, um, you know, I cannot but see, read, you know, especially because the form of his writing, especially in the phenomenology of spirit, it is, that's the form of the writing, right? So like this one, two, three, whatever. Um, I cannot but see that, but that, but the, the three presented in a movement, right? It is the, the giving a movement to it, which happens because of uh, time, Right, bringing time into the, the glassy infrastructure of the Kantian program that gives us, um, you know, these, these presentation of the dialectic not, not as a problem for, for truth, but actually as truth. Because what, what I think another way of saying what, I'm, I'm, what, I, what I read there is, uh, what Fred was saying about the, the, the homo having this hetero in it, it is that that's the movement of the dialectic, right? Of that apprehension, which I find, you know, it is, uh, well, on the one hand, the way in which it's presented is evil, but beautiful. I love the form of presentation. It's evil, uh, it's violent, and the, but, I, but it's, I hate it, but it's, it's beautiful. And, it is, and it's beautiful because it, it, it acknowledges what, it, in the Kantian program could not be acknowledged, which is the messiness. And it include and, and the dialect Hegel adds movement to that to and it is a movement that is not a movement that is given by freedom. Uh, it is the, the trajectory, the unfolding of freedom is an effect of necessity because the the putting movement in the in the laws of logic and making them into you know that thing that maps history is what. In, in his program actually upholds, makes, makes liberty, I mean, makes freedom actually, you know, makes it possible this statement that reason is, is freedom. So again, just to organize it, two things. Number one, um, the image of, of the, the, the argument that appears in the presentation of the Hegelian dialectic is that of this laws of logic turned into the movement of history actually in time. That movement is a movement that allows for the accounting, taking into account of the hetero, but then the, you know, bringing it back into some kind of one, uh, complex one. And, and then, but that, that is still given by the principle of identity and the law of non-contradiction. Almost contradictorily, <laughs> uh, still it is uh, uh, that, the, the, the possibility that, I mean, no, okay, I, I don't wanna spend much time into that because it gets uh, very abstract, but that, that how, that's one way of talking about it without repeating what we always repeat about the laws of logic and dialectic, which, you know, you know it's there in the, in the manuals. So maybe I'll just ask two final questions. Um, the first is uh, for Professor Moten. Um, Bruce says, I'm thinking of someone like McCoy Tyner playing piano in a subordinate or supporting role in now different versions of Coltrane's A Love Supreme, where we may want A Love Supreme in its variations, but it remains Coltrane's composition in a crucial way. Is that right? with its limits and problem limits, differences subordinate to the same, illustrating the inadequacy of the homo-hetero opposition. In relation to Denise's points, there's also their work time and its commodification. You're muted, Professor Moby. Very briefly, muted, like, uh, like Miles, <laughs> but not <laughs> But uh, what, what I would say is, you know, when I, when I started thinking about homotopy in relation to homophony, it was very much in relation to 
you know, and, you know, thinking about certain moments in the history of the music, you know, black music. And so Train was part of that, but it was also Ornette Coleman and, and, and maybe, a, you know, a sort of little comparison of Coleman and Train is useful here. Um, actually, last night, I was listening to these early recordings that the first recordings really that, that, that Coleman did um, live recordings in this little club in Los Angeles called the Hillcrest. Um, and, and in that club, in those dates, you know, he had sort of classic court, you know, it was Billy Higgins and, and, you know, Charlie Hayden and Don Cherry, but he also was playing with the great pianist Paul Blay. And, but Blay was basically laying out of the songs. Blay was not accompanying. There was a moment in which what, Col what Coleman realized is that the subordination of the pianist so that the pianist is understood as an accompanist who at the same time maintains reference to the underlying harmonic structure of the song in it, so that so that on the one hand the 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 the, the pianist accompanies and subordinates himself and serves the, the 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 voicings of the of the soloist of the horn player essentially of Coleman but by the same token what the pianist also does is he has a kind of a, a policing function within the band, right? And that policing function is to continually make constant, is to make constant reference to the underlying harmonic structure in a way that then provides a framework that the, you know, that the knowledgeable improvising horn player must accede to. So for Coleman to free himself of those harmonic constraints, it meant laying the, the pianist laying out right now what's interesting about coltrane's bands is that he always maintained the pianist and when he went from mccoy tyner in the early quartet to alice coltrane in the in the later versions of his of his ensembles but but it feels like the way that the pianists are playing is it's it, it feels like what coltrane is interested in is re re Reinstantiating the presence of the pianist, but not in the interest of homophony, but in the interest of heterophony, right? That the, that the pianist no longer, that on the one hand, the horn player has decided not to accede to the sort of policing function, the policing harmonic function that the pianist has. And on the other hand, the pianist is then freed from that kind of domesticating responsibility, right? And it's an interesting phenomenon that occurs. And, and Bruce is talking about these various versions of a love supreme, and I assume he's meaning the the '64 studio version, which does one thing. But then there's this beautiful 1965 version live in a club in Seattle that's doing this other thing, right? That's and what's cool about that live version in Seattle is that whoever was recording the shit had a mic that was really close to Elvin Jones. So when you listen to that 1965 version. You can barely hear Train because who's really blowing everything up is Elvin Jones because of the way the mic is. So what's happened is that now the 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 very the the the, the actual technical process of the recording has reconfigured these relations of subordination and 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 superordination. You know, it's it's like it makes me think of Glenn Gould. It makes me think that the ideal situation would be that when the records come out. That we, what we would the, the beautiful thing would be to have a playback solution that would allow you to do the mix yourself, <laughs> right? Right? Like like at, like what if it turns out that listening to the music tends towards the situation of being a DJ, but not just a DJ, but an engineer, right? And that what you really need in order to play this shit is not just a turntable, but you need a crossfader and a couple of different turntables. And listening should become this process by which we make our own mixes. And, and what if it turns out that the study of Black music within the context of some general formulation of Black study would be the experimental operationalization of just that capacity, right? Like that would be a class that I would want to teach and take, you know? And, um, Maybe I hope it'll hope it could happen someday. Um, anyway, thanks Henry for everything, and um, you know, uh, Umania, thank you so much, and Gabrielle and Romina and everybody. And I'm shutting up now, and Denise will take us out. So. Thank you. And it sounds like you should make music. To me, is what it sounds like. 
Yeah, if only I had some skill, you know. <laughs> Um, go ahead. Um, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I was paying attention to Fred. <laughs> I was just thinking about the whole situation of making music. Um, I don't even know what part of the question I would, uh, yeah, I think I don't have anything else to add. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here with us today. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, it's been really thought provoking and beautiful and has had so many different turns. No, thank you. Thank you both of you for, um, for your questions and provocations and everybody who sent in questions and provocations and Fred as usual, as always. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, Gabriel and Romy, do you all have a closing word? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and holiday, but also not. Bye, everybody.